Hello, good evening and welcome back once again to In The Know, brought to you by The Racing Post and Coral. It's Friday night. Uh, it is, of course, gearing up uh, for, according to the International Pattern Committee, the best race of the year. The King George uh, at Ascot tomorrow, of course. It's a battle of the generations. It's a battle of the sexes. Pretty much got everything you, uh, you want, apart from double-figure fields, but of course we've become used to that at the very top level over those middle distances for now. So Emily Upjohn, Westover and the older generation and some international interest as well. It's sure to be an absolute cracker. Speaking of international interest, we've also got the international stakes, of course. Big field handicap at uh, Ascot over the seven furlongs. You know, one of many if they have over the course of the season. We'll be hoping to find a nice price winner in that. Uh, we've got a few more two-year-old races at Ascot as well, which will uh, give us a bit more of a level on that juvenile form and a few more uh, handicaps including a bit of a treat throw one in from the Knavesmeyer uh, the, uh, the dash over at uh, York over the six furlong trip eight races will be rattling through tonight so uh, if you uh, uh, want to join us for the next hour or so then please do like and subscribe uh, if you haven't already with the, uh, the stream in the Racing Post YouTube page and get your comments on the chat box as well and I'll try and uh, get a few in even though we are a bit tapped for time with so many races uh, but uh, thanks for watching uh, tonight uh, and uh, hopefully we can put you in the direction of a winner or two. Uh, we've uh, got the King George, of course, the feature of the uh, uh, the day tomorrow. We've got our very own punting royalty in the studio tonight as well. Uh, King Keels is uh, ready and raring to go. You've left the crown at home, though, Paul. Uh, King Keels, not sure about that. You know, I wrote a piece a couple of weeks ago about losing runs, and I said I'm not actually on one, and since then it started. Ah. Uh, you know, so I come with a wealth warning tonight. Hopefully, it's going to change. But no, things haven't been going my way last couple of weeks. So you, you, you almost you could feel it coming. You thought I'll try and get uh, this out. Yeah, print. yeah. Why not? I'll tell you how bad it feels, and you know how you get through it, etc. And uh, yeah, I'm in it now. I'm right in the mire. So hopefully we get out of it. It's a good card. I fancy a few. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's yeah. nothing. There's no better time to go on a losing run than uh, a week before Goodwood and Galway, oh, is absolutely. there? Absolutely. I love Goodwood as well. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's a bit frightening. Yeah. Well, there we go. Fingers crossed we can get it back on track at, uh, at Ascot and York tomorrow. Uh, joining us uh, from uh, home, uh, it's Tom Siegel's birthday. So uh, he'll be having a, a single cake with a, uh, a candle in it. And uh, we've got to uh, uh, Scotland's finest export, Keith Melrose, to, uh, to step in for the evening, uh, live from his custom-built voiceover booth at home. Hello, Keith. <laughs> it's birthday today. I forgot to wish him my best. The irony of me saying that you were in your own uh, voiceover booth and then the producers, I think, forgot to put your, your fader up there, Keith. But yeah, um, <sighs> happy birthday to, to Tom from, from all of us. But uh, uh, Keith, no pressure. I've uh, got a few sprints on it tomorrow as well. So um, you've, been, uh, uh, you've been going over the five and six furlong formal season. Confident? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I am. I mean, the, the Ascot race isn't... The York race has got a better betting look to it for me than the Ascot one. The Ascot one looks fairly straightforward. Uh, but nothing fancy there. But I, I did get really tucked into those, uh, and I'm looking forward to them. Okay, lovely stuff. Well, hopefully, we can find a few winners in the sprints uh, from Keith then, and maybe uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, David Stevens uh, joining us from home, uh, representing uh, sponsors Coral tonight. David, uh, what have you got up your short sleeves tonight? Anything interesting? <laughs> Good evening, Ross. Good evening, guys, and happy birthday, Thomas. Yeah, look, I, I know Tom, who isn't with us tonight, but he's a huge fan of the King George, and there is a piece on the Race Post website at the moment sort of asking where does the King George sit, and, and I'm actually sort of giving the bookies perspective on there, and the simple answer is it's a massive deal still. If we go back to 2019 and sort of the last full year, really, of figures, obviously, without betting shop closures and what have you over the last couple of years, the King George was the 13th biggest race of the year by betting turnover. Now, it's a race dominated by the Grand National and the Chowton Festival. So it shows that the King George still has huge appeal with punters. And I think this year's renewal is as good as, as any that I can remember in recent years. Only six, but like the Coral Eclipse, it's a good six. It's a competitive six and it's a classy six. So, yeah, I think there's still plenty of life in the King George. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it was it was you that said it, wasn't it, Keith, on the, uh, when we brought the flat pack a few weeks ago, that, they, that officially the King George is over the past, is it the past decade, the, the classiest race on the calendar? Uh, yes, yeah, so the European Patent Committee, or certainly the British Patent Committee, they base it on the last three years and the, the end of season ratings of the first four finishers. And on that basis, so from 2019 to 2021, on average, the King George has been the best race run in Britain. 
Okay, well, let's hope we get a cracking renewal tomorrow there. Um, and uh, without further ado, uh, let's start going through the races that we're going to uh, get stuck into, starting off uh, with the Princess Margaret, Group 3 for the two-year-old fillies uh, tomorrow. And uh, Lazoo will be one of the, uh, the first... Uh, uh, shorties of the day, although drifting out a little bit, it was priced up a bit shorter than this earlier on uh, for the uh, the opener. Lazoo is now two to one. Glen Laurel is five to one. Royal Charter six to one. Palm Lily fifteen to two. Kinta is fifteen to two. Mini Tonka is nine to one. Breeze ten to one. Omni Queen twelves and bigger prices the uh, the rest. Uh, Lazoo coming here at uh, two to one. Two from three. Uh, this uh, this filly uh, and the third uh, run in defeat last time out in the. Cherry Hinton, as it used to be called, was was pretty unlucky, and that race is a, a, a perfect prep for this, and this is probably, even though Lazoo's up against a lot of unexposed types, this might be a little bit easier, actually. Yeah, I think it is easy. I think she said, well, she obviously sets the standard by a long way, because the others haven't really had a chance to, mm. to show how good they are, but I mean, it is a high standard, she says. Um, if, uh, you know, if we had some fit for purpose rules in Britain she probably would have got that in the stewards room against more to carry her across the track I think that's good I, I do think that's a good piece of form uh, and like I said she sets a standard by a long way I can't really understand the weakness I thought she'd go the other way I thought she'd end up very short I see Glenn Lowell is his second favorite around five one for Kevin Ryan impressive winner on debut but time was dreadful mm. uh, the the uh, runner-ups been beating at a handicap I think uh, and has rated something like 71 uh, you know so we're talking a long long way off uh, what there is to uh, what she's got to produce to beat the zoo, who I think you know, 15 or 8, 2 or 1, whatever she is, is I think so. I think that's a perfectly reasonable price. Mm. And she's in box nine, which um, looks spot on. Well, yeah, I mean, just on all, all, all recent evidence, you know, on the straight track, they're all gonna, you know, they're going to end up heading towards the, uh, the stand side. Um, you'd imagine they'll almost certainly do that in the, in, the, in the bigger field races. Well, you know, I think they went. I think they went down the, the centre today, um, but it was the Lady Amateur right, just based on the straight track, wasn't it? So, mm. so whether they do or, or, or the, not, the, the, the not, the early races they went down the centre, but still this near yeah, side. Yeah, they still come to... over a little bit, don't they? Yeah, so yeah. you know, I think that's I think that's what will happen. That's what normally happens these days, isn't it? Yes, it is indeed. Lazoo then two to one favourite uh, here, um, and uh, as I said uh, at Newmarket Race last time, out, thirty-two runners have come from that to this, and eight of them have won in the past twenty years, which is a pretty damn good strike rate for that. Uh, yeah, Glenn Laurel. Those other horses I thought were a little bit interesting. Uh, Keith Kinter uh, has looked pretty impressive. Nice turn of foot for her, uh, uh, and also Minnie Tonka, who was beaten behind Lazoo, but seemed to hate every minute of running at Newmarket. I know she's from the family of Angel's Hideaway. You won this a few years ago. I thought she could be interesting. What, what did you make of this race? Yeah, I think we talked about how good a record the Cherry Hinton has in informing winners of this race. And I think it's because of what you said. There's very few other opportunities for fillies to, to really sort of stamp what they're going to do before they come here. You know, the Cherry Hinton comes. It's the one after Royal Ascot where that form tends to coagulate. And Lazoo, you know, she's lost absolutely nothing in, in getting beat by Moj in that race. It's, it's form that stands out a mile in this. And, you know, yeah, you're right. That your Mini Tonka is one of the other few that has had a chance to show herself against these fillies. Wasn't totally disgraced, despite the fact that she wasn't all that comfortable through it. So, yeah, I can sort of see that one. But I'm sort of with Keels. I, I think this Lazoo, I was looking at this race and I thought I'd see her about five to four. And she's currently, you know, a, a fair bit bigger than that. So, uh, you know, she's the one I'd be thinking about. OK, Lazoo then, head of the market here at 2-1. to one, uh, for a Pretty solid favourite. We're all pretty much in agreement that she'll go very close, although I'll have a little nibble at 9-1 to one each way, Mini Tonka. David, anything we haven't mentioned? No, I mean, I'd, the form is there, obviously, for Lazoo. But I, it is interesting why she's so relatively weak at the moment. Um, I say out to that two to one. I, I mean, lots of unexposed types against her. The old could be anything. I mean, Kinter first run on turf, I thought was interesting. Maybe the each way selection against a favourite. But yes, yeah, she has the best form in the book. She was unlucky at Newmarket last time. Um, yeah, hard to see really why she's she's been so easy to back at the moment. Okay, let's do then two to one. Uh, hello to everyone watching at home. Uh, to uh, to Pablo, Mike Smith, Craig Warns, Jim Freighter. Good evening to you. Uh, Stevens ninety nine, you Montgomery, uh, and Devo says Cuban mistress is overpriced here. Yeah, of course that Eddie's boy form uh, has uh, been given a bit of a, a frank, and the uh, the team are in good nick. But uh, the only race of the day, um, I think we're all. Well, I'll go with Minnetonka, given that. Uh, given the the price, but I think we all think Lazoo's going to go pretty close. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, I'd say so. Okay, there you go. That was um, it's pretty much never never usually that simple, is it? Never usually that simple. I think you got a price boost, David, before we move on. 
Yes, indeed, we have. Um, and if you obviously fancy Lazoo, which the guys do, we'll chuck in Palm Lily as well. And you can have 13 to 8 about both of the Rafe Beckett runners here. He's also got Palm Lily, so a very strong hand. But uh, yeah, you get Lazoo and Palm Lily, 13 to 8. OK, lovely stuff. Price boost there for the opener at Ascot. Uh, moving on then uh, to the, uh, the 2.25, the, uh, the second race at Ascot uh, tomorrow. The, the Valiant Stakes here, Phillies and Mares, a Group 3 uh, over the round mile, uh, which could be quite crucial because the favourite Zambak is in that one box. Won't be the first time Jim Crowley has been cursing that draw on the round course at Ascot in the silt. He's 15 to 8, though, on a horse who was beaten at Royal Ascot last time out. Uh, November is 4 to 1 with Jumbly, Oscular 11 to 2, Kind Gesture 13 to 2, and then a big jump out to snooze and you lose at 20s uh, and bigger prices the rest. And um, this uh, race was upgraded to a Group 3 on the, uh, the last couple of seasons. And, um, Lady Bothorpe won it and Dream Loper won it. They've both gone on to win Group 1, so it could well be that this is a stepping stone for a, uh, uh, for a big race, Keith. But when I actually went through this uh, line-up, I thought, oh, this is a, this is a Group 3. Uh, but um, maybe I've been a, bit, been a bit harsh on a few of these, but we've been banging on about the Royal Ascot form for the past month, haven't we? And Zambak represents it. She does. She's one of, I think, three in the race that represent Royal Ascot form. And yeah, it's it's handicap form. It's very strong handicap form, handicap form that I said at the time that I was going to follow. You know, that Sandringham looked really strong. And I said that I really liked the form the, the, of that race. And Heredia was a, was a very good winner, obviously, beaten since. But yeah, you're right. You look at the race and think, oh, is it a Group 3, really? But there's a horse with Group 1 form in this race on the track, and it's November. And she, she ran on the straight mile at Royal Ascot in the Duke of Cambridge and you know going off in front in the straight mile it's maybe not the way to win races like that it's the way she races and, uh, and she was still second behind Saffron Beach coming well into the last four long and just faded out of things it's, she's got form you know she, Zanback and horse, Jumbly horses that have got ambitions of going higher may well have to be better than her in this race to beat her but she's not done it yet in November or oh, I think on RPR she's about what, about five pounds clear or something and her form is just better on what we've seen so far. Uh, I, th I thought she was one of the prices that stood out a little bit. Yeah, OK, November, yeah. We'll be running Group 1s and Group 2s. Um, uh, different jockey. This horse has been to Ascot three times. Um, uh, a different jockey every single time. Different ground on the straight track, round track. Um, what never changes with November is, though, that she blasts out the stalls and just keeps running as fast as she can. Well, she does, yeah. I mean, she's going to have some pace pressure as well, probably, isn't mm. it? Because we've got a school in here and there's another one whose name I can't remember that makes the running as well. Um, well, it has made the running. So Snooze and you lose is definitely lose, a front yeah. runner as well. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, yeah. Uh, so there'd be, a fair, there'd be a fair amount of pace. I mean, I think, you know, November, didn't she win the German guineas on, you know, bottomless ground or something? Mm. She, she won it by a long way. So I wonder whether that she wants, you know, to, to, to be her absolute best. She probably wants a bit of ease in the ground, which she won't get. And I couldn't quite get the difference in price between Zambak uh, and Jumbly, who, you know, Zambak represents handicap form. We know it's good handicap form, but Jumbly's running two guineas. She was only beating two lengths in the French guineas, and she had a wide draw. I got stopped in a run twice in the German guineas when she was six then, uh, and she was staying on at the end. I expect her to, you know, really appreciate the way the race is going to be run. Uh, and hopefully if she gets the brakes, uh, I think she's going to go very close. Yeah, Jumbly, she comes from a great family as well. He, he, uh, her dam improved gradually with mm. every year to become a, a Group 1 winner. And yeah, Holly Doyle's um, rise to track. Well, yeah, I'm, I am so, I'm, I'm worried about Zambak, hold the performer, one box on the round track, Jim Crow. Well, yeah, I mean, I think they might get stretched out here, so they might, yeah. not, be so, they might not be so much of a problem. And I do, yeah. I do fear Zambak because it is good form, but she is going into group company. They, they, you know, those races are quite often run a little bit differently too. Uh, and again, it's on the round course, not the straight course. Um, and she's just short enough. I, I would have had left, less between those two in the betting, and I would have everything uh, past November a little bit bigger in the betting as well, I think. Yeah, OK. Yeah, they didn't seem anything um, sort of at double-figure odds that looked um, obviously overpriced. I guess maybe Ida Koss a little bit looked um, a, a bit big if Oscula's a 11 or 2 shot. I'm not sure that's a 33 to 1 shot, but yeah, really struggled with this one, uh, David, because, uh, or personally I did, because of, 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 of a variety of factors, but our, uh, our pundits have got a few up their sleeves. Jumbly for, uh, for Keels, November for, uh, for Keith. Anything else tickle your fancy? And of course, Jim Crowley, the coral rep on the favourite. Yes, indeed. And, and Jim looking forward to having another go at Ascot on this filly, of course. He got it slowly away at the Royal Meeting and didn't have the clearest passage through, then got bumped close to the line. 
Uh, so he's looking forward to having another go. He didn't seem too concerned by stall one. Um, he was very, very optimistic about this filly. She's 15 to 8 favourite. Actually, very, relatively easy to back this afternoon out from 13 to 8. The one that's been backed is the stable mate, uh, Kind Gesture, who absolutely dotted up at Windsor. Hard to know just how good that form was. But, I mean, she looks to be, I say, going the right way off the back of that performance. And she has been backed into 13 to 2 from 8 to 1. And they're both trained by Roger Varian. And they are the subject of our price boost in this race, which is Roger Varian to win this race. So Zan back in kind gesture, uh, six to four from eleven to ten. That's all my way of saying I haven't got a clue. <laughs> <laughs> Just in general, in general, David, or for this race, or you no know, life in general. <laughs> 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 nice bit of copy and pasting on the price boost tonight as well. Uh, with uh, who's got two runners? Yeah, we'll give them a bit. There of are plenty boost. more to come. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Uh, the the Valiant Stakes then. Uh, Keels. Uh, yeah, Jumbly for me. Jumbly it is. Keith. Yeah, November for me. Okay, lovely stuff. Uh, David hasn't got a clue, and um, I mean, I'm taking the mick out of you, David. But I, I spent about 20 minutes going through this race and thought. I've wasted my time. <laughs> it looks, I'm sure it'll be fascinating, but um, yeah, I went round their houses and, and gave myself a uh, headache. Plenty of people, though, fancy an oscular uh, Nick Palfrey uh, Frito Bandito, uh, which is my new favourite uh, uh, screen name. Lovely stuff there. Um, Stevens 99 going with uh, with November uh, and class tops any ground concerns, says Jim Freighter. So he is with November. Uh, going from Ascot to up to York then, uh, with a six furlong 0 to 105 sprint handicap, 15 of them uh, lining up over at uh, York, and Silver Samurai heads it at 5 to 1, Gale Force Mayor 13 to 2, Lucky Man 7s, Aberama Gone 15 to 2, Nationwide uh, is uh, 8 to 1, Mondemesh 9s, Venturous 10s, Gatham Far 11s, and bigger prices the rest. Uh, now, uh, I should be going to Keels, because taking it one at a time, but I think, yeah, I think you'll be pretty happy Keith's a sprint man. With, a, uh, w with going over to Mr Melrose here. Um, we were talking about Silver Samurai earlier in the week, Keith. He's, uh, you said he was one of your new favourite horses earlier in the year. Nothing went right for him at Ascot. Are you sticking with him? No, I can see nothing going right for him again, to be quite honest. And he's a horse. I mean, this is why I like him. He's a horse that needs just about everything to go right for him. And he's out in three. And if you're in those sort of lower stalls looking through this field, you're sort of reliant on either Atomic Lady blasting out, which she hasn't tended to do much recently, but she does done it at York sort of in the past or certainly ridden prominently. Or maybe Gale Force Maya going on or even Abarama Gold, who's down as far as eight. He's in, he's the nearest pace to the pace, really. I mean, the two highest drawn horses, Hyperfocus and Gantafar. Gantafar's made his name by running, blasting out and making all all summer. And Hyperfocus just bombed out and got the rail at Haydock last time when he won that race under under support. So I can see a lot more pace high than I can low. And I'm just inclined maybe to have a look in, in the high numbers instead. And a lot of the fancy runners are in, in the low numbered stalls. So there's a bit of, there's a lot of juicy prices there if you can see one in. I thought Nomadic Empire was interesting. He actually went up 11 to 2 favourite for the big uh, six furlong race at the Dante meeting on the back of a race at Ripon where he, he just got mullered loads of times. I think it was up the rail and, uh, you know, usual sort of Ripon hard luck story. He improved last back end at York. He won here in September and finished fourth in October. And, um, and yeah, it's not, nothing's gone right for him since, really. He's just, you know, usual sprints. Something goes wrong. Last time at Ascot, he got bounded about at the start from probably the worst draw in that race. Uh, and I don't think he's done a terrible amount wrong in order to come down the weights like he has. And I thought he was quite interesting. Uh, I think you can get about 14 to 1 of him. Yeah, well, you're kind of taking the words out of my mouth a bit there, Keith. Yeah, I thought Jason Watson on board as well, who's got a record of second, first, fourth, third on the uh, the horse. And, and they've, done in, they've done incredibly well to get this horse down to 97 in a few runs. And... Um, yeah, it's uh, box 11 with a bit of pace around him. David O'Mara, who won this a couple of years ago with Musica, thought Nomadic Empire was interesting. Keels, anything, um, anything stand well, out I to you? I can't believe he hasn't mentioned Bondemish. Oh, well, we, we were waiting for you, mate. We knew you would. We well, knew you would. He started talking about horses that need everything to drop right, and uh, he, didn't get, he didn't get a mention. Uh, no, I love Bondemish. Um, I do think he's probably a five furlong horse, more than a six furlong. Although he always finishes strong at five, doesn't he? But yeah. when he's run at six, he hasn't finished as strongly. So, uh, no, I was giving Atomic Lady just one more go because she's back at York. Um, I thought she shaped pretty well on her return um, mm. from a break when she was midfield in that uh, that big three-year-old sprint at the track um, in June. 
Uh, but she has gone missing a couple of times since. I mean, once in listed company over seven, which wouldn't have suited her, and, and, and then uh, down the field at Newmarket. But she's back here. Her three best RPRs are at the track, mm. uh, including a win last year and a second in the big sales race where she split Ever Given and Wings of War. Um, I mean, that's group class form, uh, isn't it? That, 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 would, that was group class form. It probably wasn't group class form at the time, but they have gone on and, and she arguably hasn't, but she's now six pound lower than she was mm. uh, at the start of the season. And, and, you know, and, and I think she's very competitively handicapped if uh, if she can get out and get on with it. Because like Keith said, there is more pace on the high side and she's drawn in two. But um, you know, she can go forward, so why not? Yeah, OK. To me, still, he's atomic lady then. That's been a little bit of money out, 14 to 1. Uh, it is uh, for, uh, for Atomic Lady. But yeah, uh, it looks at Mon de Mesh. What a, <laughs> what a guy. Uh, but I mean, I mean there's, there's a horse. I mean, Lucky Man makes Mon de Mesh look uh, straightforward, doesn't he? So, uh, but yeah, you've got Aberama Gold will probably go forward. Gale Force Mayor, I mean, that floaters form is, is, is rock solid as well. And um, I went back and watched the replays of this race the last couple of seasons. And um, God knows how venturous won this last year. Came from dead last got up in it on yeah, the line yeah. in a photo so even at a speed track where you think they never come from the back um in this race the last couple of seasons it's oh if they go too fast anywhere they'll come from the back won't they like, true you know, it's as simple as that really isn't it? yeah you can all and, and and it's only tracks like york where jockeys know it's a speed track that's the only places they ever go too fast yeah york epsom good they go too fast at tracks where they know they think they can get away with it yeah, and they think, oh, yeah, they think, don't worry about it. We're not going too fast because there is no too fast. We're at the, we're at York, and then one day they they tip over and uh, and Venturous comes from the clouds. Uh, David Stevens, some nice prices uh, for uh, for us on offer there. Do you have any extra places, any price boosts? Uh, what else have you got? Uh, yes, four places each way in this race. Unfortunately, our beaten by a length offer is on all the Ascot races tomorrow, but there's bound to be some hard luck stories in this one. Uh, Nomadic Empire that Keith likes is 16 to 1, and Kills is Atomic Ladies 14 to 1. I thought Nationwide went well on his first turf run last time, and could be more to come from him. And you mentioned there the floaters form for Gale Force Meyer as well. She's in really good form at the moment, so they'd be my two in a really tricky, typical York sprint. Yeah, absolutely. Lovely stuff. But um, yeah, you either love it or you hate it. Uh, as uh, York handicaps do get some people's blood pumping. Chris Meister says Gale Force Meyer for me. It'll be champagne and caviar if she wins. <laughs> the Stevens 99 Gathafar each way, consistent and course form. Uh, Keel's just reiterate the pick. Uh, yeah, Atomic Lady. Atomic Lady it is. Uh, Keith, I think we're in agreement at one at a decent price. Yeah, the Nomadic Empire, yeah. Nomadic Empire it is. David Stevens? Uh, I'm in agreement with that last measure there, Gale Force Meyer. Um, caviar and champagne it is. There you go. Of course, uh, which is what you uh, you have every night for dinner, David, so there'll be no change there whatsoever. Uh, so uh, good luck if you're playing at uh, York tomorrow in that 240. You really need to see a doctor, David. It's not healthy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of champagne, uh, the, uh, the Moe and Chandon International Stakes is the uh, the next race we're going to look at. Seven furlongs here for this uh, Heritage Handicap. Uh, it is uh, one of Ascot's uh, premier uh, races because they have them all season, don't they? Seven furlongs, big fields. This is what Ascot handicaps are all about. Uh, and uh, when you think about an Ascot handicap, dark shift uh, starts to rub his hooves together in anticipation. Nine to two, the Hunt Cup winner. Uh, Jumbie is 13 to two, comes out of the, the Wokingham. Fresh uh, also loves it around here at seven to one. Air to air is eight to one. Chief of Chiefs, tens. Tactical is 10 to one. Bless him at 12s. Adatus uh, at uh, 12 to one. Other ones to mention, like I said, loads are here in, uh, with chances. Bless him. Uh, in fact, he's in there, isn't he, at 12s. Uh, King Zane for the Charlton's. It looks a little bit interesting. Star of Orion, who was second in this last year. Uh, Accidental Agent, of course, he likes it uh, here. Uh, and a few also got course form, like Roskillin uh, and Documenting. Uh, but if there's a, a bomb-proof system that you can follow any time, it is when Keels has had his absolute potatoes on one in a big <laughs> handicap at a festival, and it goes completely wrong. Back it next time yeah, out. Yeah, there's about seven of those in this race. Though. That's <laughs> <a problem. laughs> well, you might be getting even money Dutch if you back the wall. Uh, I'll give you Fresh, Ross Colin, a uh, uh, decent bit of Ross Colin in the, in the Bunbury Cup. Fresh and in the Wokenham charts completely ruined by the fact that the, the one big the one big field race when they all decided to be on the stand side and he was drawn seven. Because he knew uh, you backed him, mate. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he uh, he finished easily the best of the horses drawn in single figures, but um, wasn't good enough on the day from where he was. Uh, he's got a shot, he's in 12. I still have this horrible feeling that they're all going to come over again, so I want to go higher still. So I've gone, I've gone for Aratus, who was only 10th in the, uh, in the Hunt Cup. Now, 
I think that it hasn't gone right for him in two, two runs at Ascot. He was on the wrong side in the Victoria Cup. He actually finished just ahead of Dark Shift from that side of the draw. Uh, obviously, Dark Shift came out, won the Hunt Cup. And then, uh, and then last time uh, at the meeting, he was, in, he was in the Hunt Cup and he raced in, this, in the group on the stand side in the early stages. And when the groups merged, it was quite obvious that those on the far side uh, were well clear. And he finished third of those he raced with, and the winner, I mean, the, the, the winner was Sinjari, and the second was bless him. Uh, They're the only there. two winners now, that have come out. Exactly, of the race but as well. he saw he saw plenty of daylight in the early stages on the wing mm. of that smaller group as well, which I don't think suited him, and I don't think he quite got home at a mile either, uh, because he travelled really, really well through the race. He certainly travelled very well, for, uh, being very keen in the Victoria Cup. So I'm going to give him one last chance because he's, he's come down a couple of pounds, and he was very progressive at seven furlong last year. Uh, I give him a shot, and I've had a few quid at a bigger price on King Zane. Mm. I thought he was interesting. He was Group Two tried when with, with uh, Mark Johnson a, a couple of years ago. Um, just seemed to go missing last year a little bit, um, but there must have been something wrong because his season ended in July. And he's gone to uh, Harry and Roger Charlton, and he's won two absolute crackers on the All Weather in the spring. Set on the second occasion, beating Saw above, who's quite a a solid all-weather horse mm. who had beaten fresh the time before. He's a uh, Kempton stalwart, yeah, isn't exactly. he? exactly, and he thrashed him as well. Three lengths, three and a bit lengths. Um, he's paid for that, obviously, with an eight-pound rise for winning, you know, what's a Mickey Mouse race in comparison to this. Um, but he, you know, he, he, they thought he had group two potential as a youngster. He may still have some group potential, and he's probably not that badly handicapped. Yeah, yeah, he's a four-year-old with, uh, with a high draw and uh, stays further, uh, and he's run at the track before, so... Um, Plenty of uh, ticks in the boxes for King Zane, Keith. Um, but uh, yeah, you've got Dark Shift at the top of the betting. Uh, like I said, you also got Jumbi. And then we were talking about the earlier in the week. Um, nice to see the air to air has got that 20 box as he looks a proper, uh, a proper strongly run handicap horse. What did you uh, what did you pick out of this uh, on paper? Very tough race. Yeah, it's a very tough race. And I, I knew this is going to be a very tough bit I was going to do here because I, I was drawn in one on the round course because I had a little peek at Keels' copy and I knew he'd put up a rat. <laughs> and he's made, ex he's made exactly almost word for word the case I was going to make. <laughs> uh, I just think, yeah, I've got a lot of time for this horse. I thought, yeah, he was he was a good length up on uh, Sinjari and bless him coming at the last furlong in the Hunt Cup, having been right on the wing of that group. 7F's going to suit him superbly. And before this season, he was four from five. He's just a very unexposed and progressive horse generally. He's not had the chance to show it yet. I thought he was an absolutely knocking bet at those prices. Uh, and, and I'm going to be all over him. But, Ross, we've gone through it, haven't we? Ask at Handicaps, what do you need? You, you need form of a further. Yeah. You want form at the track. Yeah. You want to travel. You potentially want to be drawn high. So I've ended up on that system having a few quid on at a very, very big price about Top Secret, who won a couple of times at the track last year. Uh, stays a mile uh, is drawn right on 22, right on the wing actually. Um, it's the sort of horse that if he was 16s, 20s, I wouldn't back him, but there's a bit of 40s going around and, and I've had a little bit on him too, but that's mostly filling time because Aratus was the main bet. He yeah. qualifies on the one key. He had a lump on last time as well at Epsom. Uh, yeah, I guess <laughs> he set off a His two starts over. to go over him. Like, you know, when he went off at Epsom, I was expect. <laughs> I thought there's no pace in the race. He might come out here and make all, and they held him up nearly last, and he stayed there. Uh, you know, so, uh, <laughs> so yes, uh, that, that wouldn't surprise me. I, yeah. I'm going to have to back every horse in the race, basically. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> what don't you fancy, mate? I'll, I'll back that. What, have, what, have you, what, did you, what was the first oh, one you crossed off? Orban. Oh, but there you go. Yeah, <laughs> who's um, given us all sleepless nights in the past as well. But yeah, top secret, drawn 22. His last run over seven furlongs on fast ground was over this course and distance where he won uh, off uh, four pounds lower uh, at the back end of last season. So yeah, lots in with chances. But yeah, um, uh, we've got <laughs> we've got low stick in the boxes. Um, let's see what the the viewers at home think. Um, Aratus uh, for for Jim Freighter. He says, his Keel's following your system, Ross. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Royal Ascot, high draw, stays further. Lots of stuff going on. Um, uh, Aratus as well and Ropey Guest uh, for, for Stevens uh, 99 so plenty of people um, agreeing uh, with this uh, with our uh, predictions in this race I said it looked a tough race I mean it is a tough race but we're all singing from similar hymn sheets here so uh, David Stevens do you ever are, are you harmonizing or are you going against us here no I'm going to go against you you'll be delighted to know um, I think Kira's probably put Aratus up earlier in the week maybe in the weekend because it's been well back to a week from around sort of 16 to 1 down it's actually down to nine to one at the moment, but we're best odds guaranteed from now. So if he does drift back out tomorrow, you will get that bigger price. Uh, I've got a back accident. 
accidental agent just because I always back accidental agent at Ascot. <laughs> uh, but one that doesn't really fit the Ascot system is air to air because he was the favourite for the Britannia, I think, last year. And, and it's really his only disappointing run. But he came back this season and won really well at Yarmouth on good to firm ground. And I'm hoping there's much more to come from air to air. But as I say, a little bit on accidental agent as well. And five places each way in this Moet and Shandon International. OK, yeah, I'm, I'm going to... I don't think that was a disappointing run. He was sent off favourite for the Britannia. Uh, he completely missed the start. Um, he was all the way over on that far side as well. Um, and it, I thought he finished really well, David. And the horse in front of me, I had a look at this because I thought, yeah, he didn't run the track well, but playing that replay back, I think he done well. Radabag finished in front of him. He's about £10 higher. Card is £8 higher. Three horses have gone off to Hong Kong, obviously, because it was a Britannia. They've all won races over there as well. Dubai Honor was in fourth. There's only a couple of lengths ahead of him. He's now £21 higher, and the, uh, the winner, Perotto, has been placed in group races. So, I, um, yeah, I think he's interesting, David. So, I, I think kind of half agreed and disagreed with you there, but I think just saying that Britannia room wasn't so bad. Well, that air-to-air is an absolute certainty, then. That's it. Job done. There we go. Lovely stuff. I believe you've got a, uh, a price boost here, uh, David, you, for the old copy you have, and paste. But I, I bet you can't guess which trainer. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got two Eve runners? Johnson, Eve Johnson-Horton has Jumby and Accidental Agent, so Eve Johnson-Horton to win this race 6-1 to one from 9-2. to two. Don't worry, there's more cut and paste to come. Lovely stuff. Uh, David omar has got three in here. You've missed the trick. Um, as for the, uh, the rest, uh, good evening, Kieran Catterson. Hello, thanks for joining us. And Ropey guesses in the form of his life, says Frito uh, Bandito. Uh, the international stakes, Keels, which of the nine are you, are you putting uh, up first? Yeah, I'm Aratus, um, King Zane, Chief of Chiefs, John B. Darkshire. Bless him. Top uh, secret. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, Ar Aratus is the number one. OK, Aratus is the, uh, the number one then. Uh, Keith? Yep, yeah, Rata's number one for me to, uh, and yeah, a few quid extra on Top Secret. Okay, lovely stuff. Uh, and I will uh, we'll go with Air to Air. David Stevens. Yes, in agreement with you, Air to Air. Lovely stuff, there we go. Uh, kept that pretty simple in the end. Uh, the, the international stakes, so if you want that price boost, Eve Johnson, Horn to train the winner, six to one out from nine to two. Uh, then the big race of the uh, the day, uh, maybe the month, maybe the year, potentially, uh, uh, with a, uh, a battle of generations, sexes, form lines, trainers, jockeys, you name it. We've got interest here uh, from top to bottom, just the six runners, but uh, even the outsider of the, the bunch is the much-loved Group 1 winning pile driver. So if he's at 25 to 1, you know how good this race potentially is. But it's the three-year-olds who are dominating the betting. Westover uh, is a 6-4 to four shot. Uh, Emily Upjohn uh, is 11 to 4. The Curra's loss is Ascot's gain. Mishriff in at 3 to 1. Torqueda Tasso is 10 to 1. Broom 18 to 1. Pile Driver at 25 to 1. Uh, just uh, the, uh, the six runners here, Keith. But there's only Emily Upjohn who hasn't won a Group 1, and that's only by a whisker, isn't it? So, um, like you said, you were saying, when, we talk, when we were talking about the Eclipse and, and Keels and Tom, we weren't quite sure about the three year old form. Of course, Vidani. Uh, came out and, uh, and won that, and the three-year-olds are dominating here, uh, headed by uh, Irish Derby winner Westover, who was potentially unlucky at Epsom. Is he the one to beat here, or do you fancy one of the older generation to, uh, to beat the classic generation? Well, it's Emily Upjohn, his price seems to be out, doesn't it? Because Westover has been extremely impressive so far. He would have been definitely second in the Derby, and he won the Irish Derby with any amount in hand. The three-year-old form hasn't... No, Vidani obviously won, but the three-year-old form hasn't been tested. There's no way that Vidani's form links in in any meaningful way with Westover's. And the derby form itself's not been tested. You know, he's a first... They have, there's been horses that ran, obviously, West when blows won easily last week. Pittsburgh deal was, was second. It's not really a race that we've seen... You know, we thought it was a good derby. We're still sort of guessing that. Um, look, he should probably be favourite Westover. But the fact that him and Emily Upjohn were, were twos on couple just felt really wrong to me. So I was looking down the older horses... And I ended up convincing myself that it just is worth taking that chance that Turquito Tasso will handle the ground better than is assumed. Um, you know, obviously he has his form in Germany, he's often on soft ground, but as I pointed out today, there's not been a German derby run on good to firm ground since 1995, I think. So it's, it's about opportunity as much as anything else. Uh, we've had horses that have come over, German horses that have won uh, the King George before, Novelist still holds a course record. And Turquito Tasso, his dam, she had half sister, half half brothers and half sisters that made their name in Dubai on turf out there. So it's not like it's a soft ground pedigree. 
So I'm quite hopeful that he can run a big race here. He's had two runs to get fit as well, remember. And he looked a different species to the horses he beat at Hamburg last time. You know, he's, that showed that he is as good or near as damn it to, to what he was in the arc last year. That wasn't a fluke. And last time showed us that. He barely came off the bridle. So double figures are still available in quite a lot of places about Tokyo Tasso and, and Coral are nearly there as well. So it's they just he just shouldn't be that sort of price in this race. And he's the bet for me. Yeah, Tokyo the Tasso then. Uh, yeah, he's a, a nine to one shot here. Um, obviously, um, plenty of uh, yeah. I mean, it used to be French form, didn't it? That people would completely ignore in the betting, and they'd come over and they'd win at seven, eight, nine, ten to one, despite having Group One form. And now everyone's kind of cottoned on to the French race in a German form. Uh, like you said, novelist and Tokyo de Tasso in the yeah. Uh, and there was also well, that's it. He was energised. I ended up yeah. having Godolphin was like sixteen to one in the morning, went on thirteen to two, and it was so far clear on the figures going into the race. But you know, was that, it was a, almost, the centenary or whatever yeah, it is now, like wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was ridiculous at the time when you look back at it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, you, you, look, you can understand that. I think exactly the same as um, as what Keith said. I think the prices about the two three runs are just an insult to the older horses. Mm. Uh, on official figures, Emily Upjohn's the worst horse in the race, and we've got to remind, we've got to remember that that although uh, John Godson won this with two fillies in Tegruda and enabled his three-year-olds, they come from wide margin wins in the Oaks, not defeats, and they were never even entertained with going the Irish Oaks route, which is where she would have gone last week if she hadn't had travel problems, so she wouldn't even be here. Very much Plan B. Uh, I mean, I, t I suppose she won't drift because Frankie's on, but I think she ought to. Yeah. Uh, well, Westover's the one to beat, obviously, but I mean, Piz Badil, seven lengths uh, in Ireland, comes out, finishes last in what looked a weak group one in France the next time. Can, know, can I just ask you about as well? As well. So, Colin Keane, mm. uh, he's a fantastic jockey, obviously, mm. clearly an absolute top class mm. jockey. 46 rides at Ascot, no wins, one second. Now, I'm not saying mm. that, that that's a huge thing, it's just that. It's a, it, it is quite a tricky track, isn't it? To, yeah. Especially on the round track to, 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 to get right. Some jockeys yeah, ride it. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to know what he'd, what he'd been riding over there and how many he rode, you know, how many he'd been riding before he became the top class jockey that he is now. Mm. Like, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, he's got a very good, he's got a very good horse and he's got a one horse, one horse who really, really does stay the, stay the trip very, very well yeah. as, as well. Like, he's a very strong stayer. Um, that would be my little bit of a concern about Mishriff, who, let's face it, was the giant. Uh, highest rated horse in Europe last year and would have won the Eclipse with a clear run last time out mm -hmm. without a shadow of a doubt. You just have to go back and watch it again and again and again. You can't come to any other conclusion. He was the best horse in the race and I think he'd have won it in quite commanding fashion if he'd got that run. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's, not even fa he's not even second favourite, which is a bit daft, but he did appear to get outstayed last year by Adeo and John Gosling said as much afterwards. Mm. And it led me to think, well, I'm going to look for an outsider too. And I did toy with talk about the Tasso, but, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to back something, I want everything in my favour as regarding conditions. And I think just Broom loves fast ground. Mm. And I think he ran a career best last time when he ran away with a Hardwick. He'd been second in the Hardwick the year before. Um, he just, you know, he might be a six-year-old, but he just looks a better horse now than he ever has been. And he's arguably even being campaigned like one this year. I mean, he was well beaten in this race last year, but that was his seventh run of the campaign already. He'd like, you know, if there was a Group One or a Group Two going, he was in it yeah. last year. Like, you know, so. Uh, this time he's been a, been raced a little bit more sparingly. He's come out with a career best, um, winning pretty easily, and he's going back over the same course and distance. And hopefully, hopefully he'll get a lead. It, I can say, is, but is there a possibility here? Because as far as I can see, there's nothing else that, that's going to go on necessarily. Well, yeah, well, Ryan Moore took the ball by the horns last well, yeah, time. Yeah, and he didn't go slow either. He, no. you know, he, he drew it out of them. And he, but, and he won from know. the front on changing to the guard yeah, as exactly. well. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, and of course, state of rest also. I mean, the only worry is whether a pile driver decides to go on as well, because I think he, you know, he's done mm, it as well. But possibly. He, but he might. You know, I'm, I'm half expecting Broome will, will get the run, will get the lead. I mean, what he does, I mean, if you see what happened at Royal Ascot, I think he likes being away from horses anyway, because yeah. he was at pains to keep him out wide in the early stages until he got to the, until he got to the front. So uh, I'm wondering whether that's, you know, that's just how they want to ride him. Uh, and uh, yeah, if he gets it, he might just get the run of the race as well. Um, you know, best, you know, one of the best jockeys in the world on a horse that loves the trip, loves the ground, and is eighteen to one. You know, officially the same horse as Westover on the on the, on the figures. Hmm. Admittedly, there's the, you, you you weights and balances and you yeah, of course you've got you got potential and all that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But I mean, you know, horses always reach a level, don't we? We just don't know where Westover is yet. Yeah, fair enough. Um, and one of them six to four, the other one's eighteen to one. Yeah. 
fair enough. Um, fascinating clash then between the uh, the generations. Like I said, West over six to four. Emily up John eleven to four. Mishra threes. Torque de Tasso uh, nine to one. Broom eighteen to one. Pile driver twenty five to one. Uh, David Stevens, you got any? Uh, taste the offers to edges either way here and uh, do you have any strong opinions in what looks like you said uh, similar to the Eclipse uh, a very small but select field hopefully we'll get a slightly cleaner fight than in the Eclipse yeah great listening to Keith and there though and Paul there though really whets the appetite because it, it just highlights what a, a brilliant racing prospect this is where you've got a 6-4 to favourite and an 11-4 second favourite the guys don't fancy either of them now they do get lumps of weight it should be said obviously the three-year-olds which is a factor but again, as Kills has said, Westover's Irish derby form. We, Piz Badil didn't do anything for that in Paris. Emily Upjohn, obviously just beaten in the Oaks. Tuesday didn't do a lot for that form in the Irish derby. Mishriv is brilliant. I mean, he's always consistent in these big races, but it'd be no surprise to see him finish second again. And the guys have, have gone for the two that, that I fancy. I, just, I love the German bred horses. They are properly bred to get this trip. And, you know, you can't say that about many horses around Europe, but the German horse definitely will. Daydream and Noblis, obviously recent winners of this race for the Germans. And you don't win an arc by a fluke. And, and as Keith said, he proved last time that that arc win wasn't a fluke. And then Broom, uh, I think Ryan Moore probably will want to dictate from the front. He looked really good at Ascot. Okay, he's a six-year-old, so he probably isn't getting any better. But if he's you know as good as he was at Ascot at 18 to one, I think he's definitely worth taking a chance. So yeah, the two that the guys have mentioned, I fancy, but brilliant racing prospect. And there is just one more cut and paste uh, price boost in this race. I bet you can't guess the trainer, <laughs> Ross. Uh, two trainers, I believe, um, together as one. Is it the Gosdens? <laughs> it is John and Thady Gosden. Absolutely. They have Emily up, John. They have Mishriv. 11 to 8 that Team Gosdens win this King George. OK, um, I'm going to completely ignore that price boost and just back Mishriff, who's 3 to one on his own, I think. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I agree. He might well be second and, and, and set himself up for a crack at Baid at, uh, at York. But um, a part of me thinks that they'll be more worried about Baid at York and they might want to get going here. And he's won a, uh, a Group 1 over this trip uh, in Dubai, admittedly a little bit of a muddling one. And I think he probably got uh, caught napping a bit by ADR last year. Uh, Keith, any final words on tomorrow's feature race? Uh, no, I mean, it's going to be a, a great race and it's going to teach us loads regardless of what happens, really. But, uh, you know, having been such a massive Desert Crown fan all along, I'm, I'm hoping the three-year-old form takes a hit for monetary reasons. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. OK, so you're, uh, you're talking through your pocket, uh, potentially, for uh, for tomorrow. Uh, as for everyone at home, uh, their thoughts on uh, the uh, the big race, Broom Mishriff Reverse Forecast, says uh, Jim Freighter. Uh, as for the uh, the rest, Stevens has back Torquay de Tasso at 20 to 1. Uh, Nick Palfrey says Westover is way too short. Uh, Chris Mice is with Broom. Uh, uh, if Mishriff was guaranteed to get home, uh, Johnny G wouldn't be running Emily up, John, says Frito Bandito. Well, admittedly, I'm, he wouldn't be running her if she was um, if she'd gone on the plane last week. Uh, and Kieran Cadiz says, "Art winner Torquay de Tasso has the best form on offer by far." So there we go. Fantastic racing prospect tomorrow. Whatever wins, it should be an absolute blinder. But you're hoping, Keels, that um, you get a big prize winner. Yeah, but I got a quid on Broom. Broom, it is Keith. Yeah, Torquay de Tasso. Okay, lovely stuff. I'll go with Mishriff and David. Uh, I split stakes on Torquata, Tasso and Broom, but I did forget we've got a price boost in this race. Not a lot of love for Emily Upjohn on this forum, but if anyone does fancy her, she's out to 100 to 30. The Coral Compilers clearly don't fancy her either. 100 to 30 from 11 to 4, maximum of 30 quid. If you do still keep the faith with the filly in the race. Lovely stuff. Thank you for that. David, three more races to, to get through on the Ascot card tomorrow then. And uh, we've got a, uh, another two-year-old contest on the agenda coming up at 10 past four. Uh, the, the Pat Eddery stakes here. Uh, and a Charlie Appleby, William Buick, Godolphin, short price favourite. It's like to get to that time of year where the... Uh, they're good two-year-olds start to to run in Pat and Company. And Naval Power is 11 to 10 favourite. Finn's Charm tests the Chesham form 100 to 30. Waiting all night is 9 to 2. Mascarpone is 13 to 2. And Bajan Bandit is in at 8 to 1. But Naval Power, uh, two from two so far uh, uh, in a, a race that, again, is... It looks a bit messy on paper. These listed races, seven furlongs, two-year-olds, they're never that particularly strong. Yeah, stalls in the centre, wide track, uh, you know, and it's, you know, they could run all over the place, couldn't they? I, I think um, thing about naval power, I think, is very much a work in progress, which is why they've kept him to the smaller tracks to start with, uh, you know, uh, Leicester and, uh, and Yarmouth. Um, so he's just looked very green. 
but he's also looked very talented. Mm -hmm. And I think we might see, you know, we, you know, we'll see him get better with every single run. And I think he's already just about good enough to win this anyway. Um, so yeah, I, I came to the conclusion looking at the others. I thought they are sort of what they are, uh, and he's the one with the potential to be a lot better. And I just thought he'd win. Okay, fair enough. Keeping it uh, keeping it simple with uh, with Naval Power, who's in at eleven to ten, probably because yeah, like uh, like Keel says, Keith, the rest of them aren't exactly. Um, getting you over excited, or, or be it, I did think I can't quite understand why Beige and Bandit's the outside of the entire bunch here. He got hugely outpaced at Salisbury in the final furlong, and then battled on really nicely. And um, Han and Team Ascot, two-year-olds, they, they often come on for the run as well. I thought he was a bit big. Yeah, when I first saw him in the field. I thought it was lovely to see Lenny Lungo having a runner uh, <laughs> back on the flat. Was, uh, <laughs> for those that remember Northern Chasers from the mid 2000s. Yeah, that's um, that's that's. that's I, 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 we didn't have that on the bingo sheet, Keith. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but no, I, I, I mean, I'm just trying to spill time here because my opinion is basically the same as Keel's. Naval Power has shown a lot in his first two starts, while looking like there's more to come. His dam's a half brother, to, a half sister to outstrip, who was forward enough to end up winning Champagne Stakes and whatnot towards the end of his two-year-old season. Uh, and this horse just looks like he's building up to something similar like that. A lot of other ones, you know, these early seven furlong races, except uh, with one or two exceptions, tend to be sort of horses that are developing a little bit later. And Naval Power has the jump on them in terms of experience and also in form. OK, lovely stuff. Naval Power then uh, for our, uh, our two pundits. I'll go with Bayesian Bandit, the outsider of the, uh, the bunch. And then you've got three... Uh, in the uh, in the middle there, uh, David Stevens. Um, I don't. Oh, you're gonna have to come up with something for a for a prize boost here. <laughs> we've, we've, we've only got five horses, and they're all trained by different trainers. You'll be pleased to know the prize boosts have ended for the night. But I'm with you on Bayesian <laughs> Bandit. I looked at this when there wasn't any betting available earlier. I assumed it would be just a clear second favourite behind Naval Power. In fact, it's eight to one. Doesn't put me off in the slightest. I thought he was the one, along with the favourite that. Of the most progressive and, and they're still in the sort of could be anything category so yeah Bayesian Bandit and Naval Power in the forecast Okay there we go um, Shout out to Jim Freighter though who um, reminds me that we're kind of ignoring our own thing here Keith following the Ascot form which we've been banging on about since Royal Ascot Finn's Charm is the one of course um, who went way too quick in the, uh, the Chesham it's not working out particularly well but maybe the ones on the pace Keith might be the, uh, the ones that turn that round no, that's true. I and mean, we did talk about the Chesham, how that hadn't been tested, didn't we, and on Tuesday, and how that's maybe the one that, that might not work out quite so well this year, given that it was a debutante and social runner that won the race. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's right, and we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep following the Ascot form in, in a lot of places, but the Chesham is, is the one that the jury seems to be out on. OK, uh, but it's uh, Naval Power for Keels and Keith, and Bajan Bandit for Ross and David. Uh, let's go on to the penultimate race of the uh, the night then at uh, at Ascot. And uh, what do you do when you've got a uh, a big field feature, uh, valuable seven furlong heritage handicap on the card? You invent a handicap over a mile uh, <laughs> a couple of hours later for naught to one hundred and five, <laughs> in which every single runner in it would have easily got in to the international. Who knows what's happening? But Saga is the fifteen to eight favourite for the at the Porsche handicap. Uh, Takarib Bay is 11 to 2, Random Harvest is 13 to 2, Tempest 13 to 2, Atrium is 7 to 1, Dubai Mirage 17 to 2, Power of Darkness 9s, uh, and but Pedro uh, is a 11 to 1 shot. We've also got Repertoire and Coast in there as well. And Keith talking about following Ascot form, uh, the uh, the Britannia. The winner's been sold to, uh, to Hong Kong, but the second's here for Saga. Um, uh, obviously, Frankie's been kicked off because John Gosson. Was absolutely livid with his ride on this uh, in the Britannia. Was it uh, was it as bad as he thought? Yeah, he was livid with them, wasn't he? And yeah, I think the horse probably should have won. And he's gone up eight pounds, but when I did say it's fives virtually free. So there's a lot to say why this horse is as short as he is. But talking of being livid, this race only exists, doesn't it? Because Liz hasn't yet got the price she wanted from Hong Kong for this horse. <laughs> Going to try and win this and get uh, get get increased offers. Isn't that what's happening? Yeah, I think <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. It's um, well, why not? It's, you know, yeah. it's hard to. What was the quote for, for for thesis being sold? It's hard to ignore the spending power from Hong Kong. Yeah, I mean, that was a royal family member as well. This that, that's yeah. been selling that one. So it's, let's not pretend the royals are above taking the Hong Kong money to sell the horses over there. But uh, I just thought Saga was extremely short. Given this is actually a very warm race, I've got a horse that finished third in the Hunt Cup on my shortlist, and I wondered if potentially you know it was a bit too warm for him so it's a very very hot race 
so yeah, Tempest is the one I'd, I'd gone with. He came through with Dark Shift in that Hunt Cup. He basically gave that horse a lend start when they started racing a couple of furlongs out and kept it that distance all the way to the line. So I thought in a race where you know maybe the sort of sexier profiles were taking up a, a large chunk of the market. I could easily have foreseen, you know, if you'd asked me on Monday if this horse was likely to be favourite for this race without seeing any other runners, I might have said yes, because mm. it's, uh, it's an interesting horse, Tempest. But, uh, but I just thought those prices would be a little bit too big, but it is a really, really warm race. It is indeed, but uh, Saga is at top of the betting, and uh, one man I'm sure will be using Saga very shortly, only a couple of years away. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> it's, uh, it's Dave Stevens. It's Paul Keeley. <laughs> <laughs> hell. God, oh, getting it tonight, aren't I? Oh. Um, are, you, uh, mm. are, you, are you with the, uh, the, the <laughs> cruiser? Looking, at just the can't remember where I put my walking stick. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah. Don't stand up too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, I, I agree with Keith. It's a very warm race. You wouldn't be surprised at all if Saga won it. Um, but it is very warm. You've got Atrium, who really likes the track, mm. um, bolted up here early in the season, good third last time. And one that I like is an older horse called Power Darkness, who uh, maybe seven years old, but he's in, on the right handicap mark. Um, down, uh, down to around 90, 92, I think, uh, if, I can, if, I can, if I can remember it rightly. Yeah, 92 now. Uh, one on the round horse course here a couple of years ago, one last year off, off a similar rating and returned at the Newmarket meeting from a, a fair break and was just a real eye-catcher, went third to a couple of Godolphin horses uh, that had gone clear because he came from right at the back. Uh, jockey put a whip down inside the last um, furlong and he was still going away from the others. Uh, and I just thought that was a really, really nice warm-up. Uh, and he's got a decent mark. Yes, he's seven, he's got more miles on the clock than some of these, but I think he's well handicapped. Okay, Power of Darkness then is a uh, is a nine to one shot here uh, for this uh, this handicap and yeah the one I thought well, had a half a chance we had even mentioned and that's Random Harvest who um, uh, won quite nicely squeezing through horses last time out when a blinder at Royal Ascot behind Rising Star as well clearly this track suits Random Harvest and Safi Osborne loves um, a, a hold up horse on the the, uh, the Ascot straight track as well so um, yeah tough races David. Yeah, but for the second race in a row, I'm in agreement with you, Ross, with Random Harvest. Uh, obviously loves Ascot, second at the Royal Meeting, then came out and won last time. Um, good pilot on board, Safi Osborne claiming three and drawn highest of all in ten. Look, Saga's an obvious favourite and would be absolutely no surprise uh, if if he went out and won. And uh, I love Keith's conspiracy theory. This is brilliant. Her Majesty has put this on just as so she can invite those offers in. Wonderful entrepreneurial spirit there from Her Majesty. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, you got to, uh, You can never have too much money, can you? Uh, Saga's 15 to 8 favourite uh, here. Paul Keeley, you're taking the market leader on with? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go Power Darkness. OK, lovely stuff. Keith Melrose? Still on mute here. Tempest for me. <laughs> so so he's, uh, he's dropped off there. Uh, but uh, and David Stevens and myself will go with Random Harvest at 13 to 2. Uh, last race of the card then uh, at, uh, at Ascot. Uh, Tem run over the... Five furlong trip. Uh, course form dominates at the top of the betting. Bond chairman eleven to four. Mountain Peak three to one. Lovely Manor six to one. Jawal thirteen to two. King of Stars fifteen to two. Hurricane Iver seventeen to two. Corazon nines at uh, fourteen to one. Bar those Keith. And if the uh, if the Keels angle of backing one that had a nightmare last time out that you smashed into works for you as well, then King of Stars might be on the short list. But uh, the front two in the betting have red hot Ascot form from last time out and um, look the ones to beat. But what did you make of this? Anything catch your eye at nice prices? Uh, yeah, I do feel a bit like Keely. Obviously, I've been doing the sprinters this year, and I have backed just about all of these. <laughs> and... Oh, been undone. It's something. Uh, but yeah, that, that Ascot form from last time, you and I were talking about it, and it was one of those races where you just back all the high horses that have got a chance. And then that's the race the way it worked out. Mountain Peak, when it, he was drawn in 15 of 20, uh, but Bon Chairman came from eight and shaped, I thought, better than him, uh, basically. Run him to a nose, despite being doing a lot of his own work uh, further away from the action. He's on a pound better terms anyway and shaped better. And now he's, I mean, not in a 10 runner race that might matter too much the draw, but if it does, they're both on that side in case things do end up getting quite lopsided. I just thought Bond Chairman was very much justifiably favourite for the race. I didn't have anything particularly exciting down the field. We mentioned King of Stars, horse alike, but 
Ascot's not necessarily going to be the sort of track where, where he thrives. He's a very fast horse. Uh, and I was more keen on him at Chester when he blew the start last week. Uh, so more that. So when he goes back to the track like Chester, I'll be backing him. But today, you want to stick with that Ascot form. And Bond Chairman, who was also fourth in the Holyrood House at the Royal Meeting. So further foil the Royal form. But it's actually mostly last time that I'm thinking about for Bond Chairman. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll go with that form, but I, I just I get the feeling Bond Chairman doesn't, she can't quite get home at Ascot. He keeps running well, keeps hitting the frame. But Mountain Peaks won over seven. He's won three times over course and distance on fast ground. Um, I, I, I thought he should be clear favourite, Mountain Peak. Uh, I was in, I was in Keith's. Uh, uh, That's fine. In, in agreement with Keith, really. I, I, I thought that it was the saga comment, wasn't it? Yeah, That's... yeah. I was not certainly not, <laughs> not, not even talking to you, really. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. I thought uh, I, I thought Bond Sherman would just about edge it this time, um, given the given the, the the lack of draw advantage for Mountain Peak, you know, in relation to where he was. And looking further down, I mean, Jawal has run the occasional good race here, I think, but I just, you know, lots of these horses down there are out of form, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, you can't believe how Ivor was 17 to two for a race like this, considering how he finished last season, but I mean, he's been barely sighted in two runs this year. So yeah, I think it's probably between the front two, and I just give the edge to Bond Chairman. Okay, lovely stuff. So two for Bond Chairman, one for Mountain Peak. David Stevens, anything else? You and I are either going to have a very good afternoon, Ross, or a very dismal afternoon. <laughs> because once again, I'm in agreement with you. Front two in the betting seem to have it at their mercy. But Ryan Moore on board Mountain Peak. I'm going to stick with that one. Lovely stuff. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Well, we managed to rattle through eight races there with, uh, with three minutes to spare. Uh, and as George Murray said, who do we blame for that? I mean, Tom, Tom has a birthday and we... We finished yeah, exactly. on time. Waffles away, Tom, <laughs> doesn't he? Eh? <laughs> there we go. He says as he starts to fill the extra two minutes. But yeah. uh, happy birthday to you, Tom. I hope you're having a, a wonderful time. I know you're watching at home uh, with all your family uh, around the, uh, the telly. But that just about uh, uh, brings our preview to an end for the, uh, the big Saturday at Ascot and that one race from York. But we have to, of course, get the naps of Saturday uh, on to the table, starting off with Paul Keeley. Yep, bigger to feel, bigger to certainty, so let's go with Aratus in the three o'clock. There we go, lovely stuff. Aratus it is, Keith? Um, am I allowed to double up? Because Aratus is, is my one too. Uh, sure, yeah, absolutely, why not? Yeah, let's all go for Aratus. No. Uh, okay, Aratus for Keith it is as well. David Stevens, you have anything that's not in a 50 run handicap? I was going to go for Mountain Peak in the last, but the boys are being bold, I'm going to be bold. Air to air. That Britannia run last year was much better than I thought. OK, lovely stuff. I tell you what you shouldn't be allowed to do. You shouldn't be allowed to take on somebody else's nap in a 25-runner race, should you? <laughs> no, no, that is, that, yeah, that is true, that is true. Uh, maybe I should go for air to air as well. I don't, no, I'm going to go for Mini Tonka to, uh, to outrun her price in the, uh, the opening race at, uh, at Ascot tomorrow uh, for the nap. Uh, good luck to everyone who's uh, uh, playing tomorrow. Thank you for everyone who's watching uh, at home. Uh, and we'll see you next week for five days of glorious Goodwood. My God, unbelievable. I can't wait for every bet I have to be stopped in its run at a crucial point. But either way, I'm sure that Davy Stevens will have plenty of trainer-based price boost for us. And Keel will have plenty of winners as well. Uh, thank you for everyone here in the know. Good night. God bless. Have a good weekend.